how did we get here? Those are the words I said to my dad on day five of our last big hiking trip. We had made big plans. We went to Ireland and we did a self-guided hike around the Ring of Kerry. And we had done a good amount of hiking together in California. We had done backpacking trips through the Ansel Adams Wilderness, that country of Yosemite. And we were feeling pretty confident about bringing our backpacking skills to Ireland. Little did we know when we signed up for the hike that Irish directions are a little bit different than California directions. Rather than using a topo map and compass, the Irish tour company gave us a Word document with written directions that sounded something like this. Follow the road to the fork, take the dirt path on the left. At the big rock, walk diagonally down the hill till you reach the tree. <laughs> Go through three farm gates and close them behind you, please. When you get to the low stone wall, walk four paces and look for another path. Now, these directions might not seem all that complicated, but if you ever find yourself in a foreign country with more than one big rock and multiple trees, you too might end up a little bit lost. Needless to say, at the end of day five, when we were supposed to make our way to the farmhouse where we were staying that night, instead we found ourselves in the middle of a valley with no buildings in sight. I took out our directions and reread them and asked my dad, how did we get here? This morning, we're in the second week of our five-week series, Combating Loneliness, where we're talking about what has been called a public health epidemic in the United States. According to the Surgeon General, half of Americans report feeling lonely. 49% of Americans say they have three or fewer friends. And this loneliness is impacting not only our emotional health, but our physical health as well, increasing our risk of cardiovascular disease, dementia, stroke, depression, anxiety, and premature death. Last week, Pastor Tim turned to Genesis 1, where we learned that humanity was created for community in the image of a triune God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit that experienced community within the Trinity. And humanity was created also to experience that community, fellowship together. Next week, and for the rest of the series, we'll get practical. We'll look at specific ways from the New Testament that we can combat this loneliness in our lives and in our community. But today, we're taking a step back. And we're looking to scripture and asking, well, then where did this loneliness come from? If we were created for community, if we experienced that community at creation, then where did this loneliness come from? Where did everything go wrong? How did we get here? And to answer that question, we're looking at Genesis chapter three. So if you are able, would you please stand for the reading of God's word this morning from Genesis 3. Now the serpent was more crafty than any of the wild animals the Lord God had made. He said to the woman, did God really say you must not eat from any tree in the garden? The woman said to the serpent, we may eat from the trees in the garden, but God did say you must not eat fruit from the tree that is in the middle of the garden and you must not touch it or you will die. You will not certainly die, the serpent said to the woman, for God knows that when you eat from it, your eyes will be open and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. Then the woman saw that the fruit of the tree was good for food and pleasing to the eye, and, so, and also desirable for gaining wisdom, and she took some and ate it. She also gave some to her husband who was with her, and he ate it. Then the eyes of both of them were opened and they realized they were naked, so they sewed fig leaves together and made coverings for themselves. Then the man and his wife heard the, the sound of the Lord God as he was walking in the garden in the cool of the day. And they hid from the Lord God among the trees in the garden. But the Lord God called to the man, where are you? He answered, I heard you in the garden and I was afraid because I was naked and so I hid. And he said, who told you that you were naked? Have you eaten from the tree that I commanded you not to eat from? The man said, the woman that you put here with me, she gave me some fruit from the tree and I ate it. And then the Lord God said to the woman, what is this that you have done? The woman said, the serpent deceived me and I ate it. So the Lord God said to the serpent, because you have done this, cursed are you above all livestock and all wild animals. You will crawl on your belly and you will eat dust all the days of your life. 
I will put enmity between you and the woman and between your offspring and hers. He will crush your head and he will strike your heel. You will strike his heel. To the woman, he said, I will make your pains in childbearing very severe. With painful labor, you will, bring, you will give birth to children. Your desire will be for your husband and he will rule over you. Almost there. To Adam, he said, because you listened to your wife and ate fruit from the tree from which I commanded you not to, you must not eat from it. Curse is the ground because of you. Through painful toil, you will eat food from it all the days of your life. It will produce thorns and thistles for you and you will eat the plants of the field. By the sweat of your brow, you will eat your food until you return to the ground, since you were taken from it. For dust you are and to dust you shall return. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. You may be seated. So this story is described by theologians as the fall of humanity. This is not where creation began, but where everything went wrong. And if you remember from last week, humanity was created in the image of God for community. And the man and the woman lived in the garden in perfect community without shame or blame or hierarchy, mutually sharing in these two mandates given from God to all of humanity to fill the earth and subdue it. And they also experienced fellowship with God. We see that in, in some of this, that they were walking in the garden with God, walking with God, talking with God, experiencing life with God. And God told them that they could eat of anything except for one tree. But then the fall here in Genesis. And the serpent comes to the man and the woman, and I purposely say comes to the man and the woman. If you notice in the text, it says that the man was with her through the whole thing. So the serpent comes to the man and the woman and begins to question, did God really say this? And tempts them to disobey what God had commanded. Yes, this is indeed the moment. This is the place in the directions where we took a wrong turn. This is the place where we got it wrong. This is how we got here. Humanity falls into sin and the consequences are devastating and God's responses to the man and the woman, as we saw, are are severe. And in our English translations, it's hard to pick this up, but the consequences are actually descriptive. They describe how life will be now that sin is here. They're not prescriptive. They're not what God intended life to be like. None of this after the fall was how God intended us to live. Creation was how God intended it. And while the, all of the effects of the fall on the world is a topic far bigger than we can cover in one sermon, there are four things that I think are pertinent to our conversation about loneliness. Four ways that the fall isolates us. The first is that the fall isolates us from God. Two main ways there. Before the fall, humanity was meant to live with God forever. After the fall, humanity is doomed to experience death. God says to the man that he will return to the ground from which he came. And this affects, of course, not only the man, but also the woman and all of us who came after them. Romans 5, 12 says that sin entered the world through one man and death through sin. And in this way, death came to all people because we have all sinned. Humanity fell into sin and with it also fell into death. But what's more is before the fall, humanity, as we've said, walked with God in the garden, had embodied fellowship with God. And after the fall, humanity is separated from God, thrown out of the garden. Isaiah 59, two tells us that sin separated us from the fellowship that we were created to experience with God. As beings created to be with our creator, we are grieved not only because we will now experience death, but also because we are now separated from our creator in life. The fall isolates us from God. And the fall also isolates us from one another. After taking and eating the fruit, we see things in this relationship with the man and the woman appear that were not there before. Shame, guilt, and fear. They're hiding themselves from each other, making clothes. And when God questions them, we see blame and deflection and half-truths. The woman you gave me, she did it. The serpent deceived me, the serpent did it. We find this root of isolation from others in two of the things that God says to the man. Sorry, to the woman. 
First, God says that pain will mark her experience of bringing children into the world. Physical pain is a part of childbirth, yes, I'll admit that. But many have pointed out that this pain spoken of here is actually similar to the pain in the story of Noah. When God looks down on humanity and sees the depravity that we have fallen into and God is in pain because of it. Pain will mark your experience of bringing children into this world. Emotional grieving because you are bringing children into a world where they are bound to die and they are separated from the God, their ultimate creator. Every mother and father, I think, can identify with this kind of pain. As you watch your children grow and as they experience the problems and the brokenness of this world, you hope and pray that they will love God and they'll find their people, but you're also a little fearful because with people comes pain, because now we bring pain to each other in this world. And if we think it couldn't get worse, God says one more thing to the woman, your desire will be for your husband and he will rule over you. Because of the fall, the woman will experience longing, unmet longing in her relationship. She will look to her husband for what they shared in creation, but oneness and mutuality is not what she's gonna find. Instead, she's gonna find hierarchy and competition. Biblical scholars point out that this is the beginning of hierarchy and gender roles in relationships. That before this in the scriptural narrative, there was no mention of hierarchy amongst the man and the woman. They were a community of equals, similar to the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit being a community of equals. Man and woman shared equally in the two mandates from God to rule over creation and to fill the earth. It is only after sin enters the picture that this mutuality across difference is shattered and replaced with hierarchy. Theologian Gilbert Bilzekian has famously said that far from being God's design, hierarchy actually slithered into the world on the back of a snake. I love that. Reformed theologian Karl Barth is quick to say that this community of oneness that was, and mutuality that was meant to be lived in between the man and the woman was not only meant for men and women in marriage, although that's true, but this community was how we were meant to live in relationship with other people, with our coworkers, with our people in our churches, with our families. This mutuality and community across differences between all people. And just as that community of oneness was lost and hierarchy and competition came into this relationship between the man and the woman, we see that it's also come into all the other relationships we're in as well affecting all of humanity. In creation, diversity brought mutual community and fellowship. But after the fall, diversity breeds competition and conflict and division and yes, isolation. Because we separate ourselves from anyone who is different from us. And Pastor Tim will talk about that more next week. Although humans are created for oneness and long for this mutual community, all of us are affected by the selfish need to come out on top. And on a grand scale, many of the great atrocities of human history are a result of groups of people thinking that they were created to be on top of the social hierarchy, that they were created to be better than others or meant to be an authority over others. Wars and genocides, Slavery, segregation, and yes, patriarchy are all a result of sin, breaking the unity and oneness that God created humanity for. Fall, the fall isolates us. Sin isolates us from God and from other people. And in this story, we also see that it isolates us from the rest of creation as well. At creation, humans were appointed as stewards of the earth, entrusted with the responsibility to cultivate and care for it within God's design. This calling was meaningful and missional and it, it built the kingdom of God in this world. But now humans suffer a fractured relationship with the natural world. We are in conflict with the very environment that we were meant to steward. God said to the man that because of sin, the ground will be cursed, where, fruit, where food and fruit was easily found before. Now you will have to work and sweat and toil in order 
to make the ground produce food. We strive and toil to make a living. And it's an isolating experience, not just for that man or for men, but for every human who's ever experienced job loss or vocational obscurity, struggle to scrape by or longing to find the work that will fulfill us. The fall isolates us from God and others and also from creation and this mandate that we were supposed to fulfill. And lastly, the fall isolates us from ourselves. Scripture reveals that the entrance of sin into the world not only broke things out there, but also broke something in here. In his letter to the church at Rome, the Apostle Paul says, I do not understand what I do for what I want to do, I do not do, and it is no longer I myself who's doing it, but the sin living in me. We are at war within ourselves, constantly finding ourselves doing things and living in ways that are not good for us or not good for others. We are beings created in the divine image of God, yet we are fractured within ourselves. And we have difficulty living as image bearers of God or even really knowing what that means. And we are constantly trying to find our identity in other things, our jobs or our position, our money, our image, our children, our marriage, our political party, our country of origin, our achievements, and the list goes on and on and on. At some point, we find ourselves saying, along with the author of Ecclesiastes, I I look at all that my hands have done and what I've toiled to achieve, and it is meaningless. Because when we seek after all these other things, striving to find our identity in them, we become isolated even within ourselves. And this isolates us further from others. And we're not even sure how to be alone sometimes. Can you even be alone and not be lonely? And Pastor Tim will also talk about that in the coming weeks. We were created for community, but the fall isolates us from God, from others, from the rest of creation and even within ourselves. This is how we got here. And you know, when my dad and I found ourselves lost on day five of that hiking trip in Ireland, we stopped and took out a snack and looked over our directions and asked, how did we get here? But eventually we came to the conclusion that no matter how we got here, we were insufficient to save ourselves from our predicament. We needed a rescue. And about the time we got to that conclusion, a car came driving up in the middle of this valley and a man popped out. And he was the owner of the farmhouse that we were supposed to stay in that night. And evidently, lots of Americans get, get lost at that part of the trip. <laughs> and so when we didn't show, he came to rescue us. Church, we struggle with the loneliness that plagues us. And when we stop and retrace our steps and ask ourselves, how did we get here When we look back on Genesis 1 and the community we were created for and see the fall in Genesis 3, eventually we come to the realization that we cannot fix this problem on our own. But luckily, the same scriptures that paint the problem for us also paint a solution. That just as surely as the world was altered by the fall, the world was also altered by the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus that Jesus, God incarnate, came to launch a rescue mission, that Jesus came to show us how to live as image bearers of God and to save us from the results of the fall of sin and of death. And yes, isolation and loneliness, because it is not good for us to be alone. The cross of Jesus holds the promise of reconciliation for all that was broken in the fall of humanity. Where sin brought isolation from God, Jesus brings reconciliation with God. John 3, 16 promises us that for God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son, that whoever should believe in him should not perish, but have eternal life. The fall doomed us to death and Jesus brings us the life we were created for. Where the fall separated us from God, Jesus brings us back into right relationship. In first, in, sorry, in Colossians we, chapter one, we read, for God was pleased to have all his fullness dwell in Jesus and through Jesus to reconcile to himself all things, 
whether things on earth or things in heaven, by making peace through his blood shed on the cross. Once you were alienated from God, once you were enemies in your minds because of your evil behavior, but now he has reconciled you by Christ's physical body through death to present you wholly in his sight. Where the fall brought isolation from God, Jesus brings us reconciliation to God. Through Jesus, we can once again be in right relationship with God. And where sin brought isolation from others, Jesus brings reconciliation with others. In the words of, again, theologian Gilbert Bilzekian, the cross not only provides for our reconciliation through God's vertical, sorry, reconciliation to God through its vertical dimension, but the cross also makes possible reconciliation among humans with its horizontal embrace. Galatians 4 tells us that through Jesus, we are so reconciled to one another that we are now called a family and all of us can call God our father. You are no longer a slave to sin and death, but God's child, Galatians 4, 7. And where the fall brought hierarchy and competition and selfishness into human relationships, Jesus calls us to grasp not for authority and hierarchy and position, but for humility and selflessness. As Jesus declares in Mark chapter 10, you know that those who are regarded as rulers of the Gentiles lord it over them and their high officials exercise authority over them. It will not be so with you. Instead, whoever wants to be great among you must be a servant and whoever wants to be the first must be slave of all. The people of God are called to flee from this hierarchy and competition and the claim of authority over others and to give it up as we imitate Christ. If God incarnate can give up all claim to authority in order to love and save us, surely we can do that for one another. The cross of Jesus reconciles us to God, to other people. It also reconciles us to the rest of creation. Romans chapter eight speaks of creation groaning or longing for the day that it will be restored. And God's will is for creation, for all things to be restored. We see this in the image of Revelation 21 and 22. Because in the words of theologian N.T. Wright, Easter speaks of world reborn. That God will not abandon this, will not abandon us, will not abandon creation, but will remake it. And this groaning, that may resonate with us because we live in the now and not yet of God's kingdom. God's kingdom was ushered in through Jesus, but will not be fully realized until he comes again at the end of the age. And we long for that time. But in the meantime, where the fall brought toil into our lives, Jesus breathes joy into our work as we are called to work as for him and not for people. And we are called to take upon ourselves Jesus' light burden knowing that one day all creation will be liberated from its bondage to decay and brought into the freedom and glory of the children of God. So where sin brought isolation from God and others and the rest of creation, Jesus brings reconciliation and he also brings it within ourselves. The fall broke things out there and also things in here and we are at war within ourselves, having difficulty to live as image bearers of God. But the apostle Paul tells us in Colossians that Jesus is the fullness of God's image and Jesus is restoring us into that image. That because of what Jesus did in his life, death and resurrection, we can be made new that we can put off our old selves and take on this new creation in Jesus. And this happens for believers through baptism. How wonderful that we are baptizing four people into this newness of life today. We will be doing that in the next service. And when those four individuals come to the water of baptism, they will hear the words, I baptize you in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. And then just before they're taken under the water, they will hear buried with Jesus into death. And the first thing they'll hear when they come up is raised with Jesus to new life. These are not just words for the people of God. 
We believe that newness of life can actually be found in Jesus. We believe something actually happens in the waters of baptism, that our God is alive and just as God was working in the time of the scriptures, God works today. This is central to our understanding of the idea of reconciliation that Jesus brings within us. The Apostle Paul tells us in Colossians and Romans that in baptism, believers die to their old selves, to the worldly rule of sin that happened at the fall. And in baptism, we are buried with Jesus, but we are also raised to new life. Now we can take on this new life, this new creation in Jesus, and that's not to be minimized. A theologian, Margaret MacDonald, says in her commentary on Colossians and Ephesians, identity with Christ is stated in the strongest possible terms in the scriptures. There's no question that just as believers are to share in the death of Jesus through baptism, we too are to share in the fruits of the resurrection. In other words, in baptism, we believe that God actually does a new thing in us. Jesus came in the fullness of the image of God and because Jesus died and rose again, we too can be born as image bearers of the living God. And as N.T. Wright and Michael Byrd say in their new book, Jesus and the Powers, this new life has implications for reconciliation, not only within us, but also with our relationships with other people. That as God continually restores the image of God within us, that we can that we can reach out across difference and we can have it be a call to community rather than a call of separation. And Pastor Tim will speak more on that there as well. We were created in the image of the triune God for community, but humanity fell into sin and with sin also fell into isolation and loneliness. Sin isolated us from God, from others. Sin isolated us from the rest of creation and even within ourselves. But then Jesus, where sin brought isolation, Jesus brings reconciliation. So what about you today? As you journey through life, you have undoubtedly faced many of the challenges that loneliness brings in various areas of your life. Whether you have felt lonely in your relationship with God or with others, whether you felt lonely in your vocational calling or even within yourself and your own identity. Maybe you have found yourself in a place where you have asked, how did I get here? And if that's you today, I want you to know that you are not alone in this. The next three weeks of our series, we'll be getting practical and we'll look at at ways that we can combat loneliness together and as individuals. But for today, May you be reminded of the hope that is inherent in our faith. May you be reminded that you have not been left alone, that Jesus launched a rescue mission, and that his promise of reconciliation brings restoration to every aspect of our lives. And even even today, as we live in the now and not yet of God's kingdom. So may we hold on to this truth The cross of Jesus holds the promise of reconciliation for all that was lost in the fall. And through Jesus, we find the best remedy for our loneliness. Amen? Amen. Let's pray. Gracious God, we come before you today humbled and saddened as we read about the fall of humanity and we see so much of ourselves and our own struggles in the story of this first man and first woman. God, we are grateful for the reconciliation that you bring to us. Show us today and this week your power in our lives to bring this reconciliation. May we lean on the hope that you breathe into our lives as we claim that your cross changes everything for us. We love you, Jesus. It's in your name that we pray. Amen.